And so we are now the first part of our class uh, up to resource exploration characterization dealt with all the kind of background subsurface uh, uh, background you needed. Um, fluid mechanics, uh, a bit of tectonics and geology, some thermodynamics, uh, some porous and fractured media flow, some models to describe those behaviors, a little bit on chemistry. Uh, the two weeks before spring break, we're talking about uh, characterizing what the resource might be uh, before you start investing money in it. And so we've now hopefully done that to death. Um, and so now we'll talk about different modes of geothermal production. Uh, the first, uh, we know about them all. The first week will be basically one per week. First week will be hydrothermal. Uh, the second one will be sedimentary uh, geothermal reservoirs, perhaps petroleum reservoirs doing double duty. EGS will be the third week. Uh, direct use will be the fourth. Fifth will be ground sourced heat pumps. And the uh, sixth will be thermal storage. So after spring break, we have seven weeks. So there are six topics, then the final one is clear. And those are now on the syllabus in their reordered number four. And so you'll see that um, nominally the last week, we're not going to do anything because there's nothing to talk about. But actually, if you look at the material for the next uh, seven weeks, we are here today. So I guess we're the 15th. Most of the other stuff is uh, recordings by people. On the 17th, you, there's Jim Folds and Greg Bignall, two separate presentations that I'm going to put in the same week. Uh, you can manage that. So there's no class on the 17th. The no class is the week after that because there are a couple of recordings. Um, there's no classes on EGS week because there's a recording of mine from the 29th. And Joe Moore will talk about the um, Forge project in Utah recording. Uh, not live. I'm using the ones from last week. They were live last week, last year. Um, we'll talk about direct use. Um, Patrick Fulton from Cornell has a recording there on the 5th, and uh, that's enough you need for that. Low temperature, we will have a class. So we'll talk today as we are here, and we'll talk on the 12th, uh, and that's almost it. Uh, I think the one on the 12th may spill over to the 14th, I'm not sure. But then the week after that is Sid Green talking about um, underground thermal storage. Nothing on the 21st. And then the other stuff is you doing the, uh, the 20 or so videos that are part of what you and your colleagues have put together. So that's kind of where we are. So it's not an onerous course. There is no final, as you know. And so the remaining parts of the, the stuff to do, I guess, these are the topics, the projects that you're doing right now. This is what you've been working on. Uh, through the semester. I guess for you who've been coming to class, um, we'll have to, on these weeks where we don't meet, we'll have to do the stuff online, um, but I'm sure that's not going to be a big deal. And then um, the quizzes, I guess, will be the 10% in the final couple of weeks. So as soon as I get your material, just like I did for the 2021 stuff, for those of you, you've certainly all of you have not been here on some occasions, so you'd have done the online stuff. So those are the questions that were supplied by you, uh, and those are the ones that are still supplied by you. So I guess in these last few weeks, after this date here, it'll probably take me a couple of days to get them up, but these three weeks will be a leisurely stroll through what your colleagues are doing. And so um, that's the main deliverable for this class. So it's not a, a difficult class to handle if, if it's really your um, ultimate semester here. So that's it. So that's, I think, where we're going for this. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say other than that. So that's kind of the, the uh, logistics, if you like, for our last seven weeks. Um, so we said already what we've done. Uh, the last little while, uh, we talked about a resource assessment. Really, um, it came from geological environment where you expect hydrothermal deposits to be or otherwise. Uh, being able to explore those using geophysics, geophysical signatures as proxies for certain things uh, in the subsurface. Um, we, On your own, you should have looked at, I'm sure you did look at uh, drilling, our discussion of drilling. And then I think Will Pettit had a uh, presentation uh, talking about transformation from oil and gas, of which, of course, most of the techniques for tapping geothermal reservoirs 
come are embedded in the uh, hydrocarbon exploration industry and so some transformation for that might happen if uh, hydrocarbons become less used and geothermal more although I have to say with the geopolitical output look like now looks like carbon's here to stay for a little while longer uh, all of a sudden we're not worrying so much about COP26 uh, but we're <laughs> worrying about uh, global strife I guess and so that's the uh, so, sorry. So that was the, what we talked about for the two weeks before spring break. And I guess the key figure was the one that we looked at that talked about the investment of costs in trying to reduce the risk of projects. If you're going to invest $40 million in a, a geothermal well and plant, then you'd like to know whether it can be successful. And so going from scoping out a site at relatively low cost to ultimately investing a lot of money to do direct investigation and do completions and doing pump tests to be able to, to deal with those. So that's worthwhile looking at. So now as we move into talking about uh, geothermal proper, if you like, there's a couple of websites here. Uh, the second one's not so interesting, but I did look at the first one. IGA is International Geothermal Association. Uh, and it's a presentation on all things that we'll talk about today and onwards uh, in terms of the, the surface plant. So I won't look at it here, but I think it's linked there that you can find it if you so, so wish. So we're, we're just going to kind of move through similar things that they talk about in that video, but I thought it was very well done. Um, and you should be able to understand the guy who's talking. He's either an Australian or a New Zealander, I'm not sure which. Um, one of the other talks you'll look at this week is by Greg Bignall, who works for Baseload Power. And Baseload Power are a company who um, sell uh, ORC plants, organic ranking cycle plants. So they can put this plant on your wellhead, even if you're at less than boiling point, and try and generate electricity from it, because you can use fluids that boil at less than 100 degrees centigrade to be able to generate electricity in a relatively small uh, compartmentalized thing. This is one of his figures that he uses in his presentation. And it really describes what uh, the subsurface would look like um, for one of these projects. And so basically, it takes uh, fluids that would come up from the subsurface at some temperature. You'd like them to be as hot as possible for obvious reasons. Um, depending on whether the temperatures of them, they'll come up into a separator and they will flash. And for something like uh, New Zealand, Wairaki, which is steam dominated, you can have a separation chamber which will take water that will sink to the bottom and gases which will be separated off at the top and decanted. And then the steam will be passed through a, um, a through to a turbine, will generate electricity, and then ultimately be re-injected into the subsurface once it's condensed. It might be used once in a single flash, it might be used twice in multiple flashes, or it might be used once in a flash and then put through a binary plant, uh, taking out the energy from the system when it's even at less than 100 degrees centigrade under the boiling point of water. And so we'll talk about each of those uh, today to understand exactly how uh, the system works. We fall back all the time on our understanding of exactly what the power is. It's related to the mass rate of flow and also the temperature. So high flow rates at low temperatures doesn't buy you much. Uh, low flow rates at high temperatures uh, doesn't buy you much. But you have to have both high mass flow rates and high temperatures to be able to, to generate power. And so what we'll try and do is talk about dissecting what we looked at above uh, and talking about the recovery from wells, what the plant looks like, I guess we've said that, so we've just talked about that in at least uh, outline. And we'll talk about the subsurface parts, which are how to get fluid to the well and how to get fluid along the well. You actually have most of the background from that, from what we've talked about already. And then we'll talk about the thermodynamics of producing electricity from these systems, which is, for most of these hydrothermal plants, our, our main interest. Uh, if you look at the production um, or the capacity around the world from the mid-1990s to a decade ago now, uh, plotted here, I guess for the, the total uh, cumulative production uh, worldwide from these individual reports from the countries, you see it kicks off 
in the early 70s. So this would be 1970, I guess, here. So this would be 1974. This is the, the oil shock, the embargo, oil embargo. And so uh, certainly large oil was probably the oldest one in 1920s. 19, I think it was 1918, actually, uh, in Italy. Um, the geysers came on in the 1930s. Wairaki was certainly post-war uh, as well, so around 1960. And then a steady growth since then. Since then. If you look at the outputs for the different countries, the U.S. is something like three gigawatts, so three big power stations, uh, thermal power stations. The geysers is something like um, a third of that, one, one gigawatt capacity. Uh, Japan, which you'd think the plate boundary places, uh, Japan you'd expect to be much larger. Japan obviously is fossil fuel challenge, has very little, fo has some fossil fuels, but very little. They're interested in hydrates, they have some coal, but mainly they're nuclear and imported oil. And surprisingly, they haven't grown very much um, over the decades. Um, I remember being uh, actually in 2012 in uh, Japan when after Fukushima, a year before, they're about to close down the 33rd of their 33 uh, nuclear power stations. So they had, like Germany, had decided to go non-nuke after uh, Fukushima. But I can't imagine that they're still that way. I'd imagine, I, I don't mind know if Germany will still say that way, given the uh, geopolitical situation that we're in right now. Certainly when Germany decided to go no nukes, they closed down, decided to phase out their nuclear power, but they supplemented it, ironically, with uh, brown coal from Poland. Um, to make up their, their energy needs. So, and of course, uh, Nord Stream 1, I guess, from Russia, uh, which uh, is still uh, under some kind of jeopardy, I guess, as to what, certainly Nord Stream 2 wasn't consummated, and it's uh, up in the air, I guess, as to see what will happen with, uh, with Nord Stream 1. And the 40% of the uh, supply that um, Nor uh, Germany gets from Russia right now. And a variety of different places. Where's Iceland on this? I guess Iceland is here. So going up from 50 megawatts to 675 megawatts. Big change. Iceland in the, in the 1950s used to power themselves by imports and by burning peat. and was quite a polluted uh, country as a result. Um, geothermal is a, a post-Second uh, World War addition. And so you see ver various countries with various amounts. And so you see the current global capacity, well, 10 years ago was uh, 12 gigawatts, the size only of 12 big power plants um, that you'd see. So this is what you'll see from uh, Greg uh, Bignall's talk. Uh, it's the same picture we looked at before. The water comes in from a wellhead, quite unremarkable at geothermal plants is what they look like. Everything is below surface. From the wellhead, it goes along insulated piping. Um, into places where they're gathered and separated. A separator would be just a, a tank like this, which it flows into, allowing the steam to be buoyant and the water to be non-buoyant. Water's re-injected if it's not used, and the steam is used in a turbine as it's taken to the, the plant elsewhere on site. And it's used either in a single flash, double flash, or a uh, binary type plant. And these come in all kinds of different sizes. Again, this is taken from, um, from Greg's talk, from his company. Uh, I'm not sure whether he's still there or not. In terms of different uh, locations, these are New Zealand. Uh, these, these are all New Zealand uh, because they're Greg's, uh, Greg's slides. And so these are either uh, taking out the uh, fluids and flashing it uh, to steam and then putting it potentially through a binary plant. So these condensers are just the binary plant, which is usually running with some uh, fluid that has a boiling point of the order of 30 degrees centigrade instead of, of the order of 100 centigrade for, for water. And we've seen this before when we looked at uh, Wairaki. So, so in terms of the sequence of things, um, our interest is in one, getting it to the well, two, getting it along the well, and three, getting it out through the power plant, which I guess is up here, uh, to be able to generate power. So those are the logical progressions of the three things that we'll, we'll talk about uh, today. 
And so we already covered in some respects uh, the flow through porous media part. So I'm just trying to give you some tips on quick calculations that can be done to be able to, to give you broad scale estimates of what the outputs of some of these uh, fields might be. And so we've looked at this before. We've talked about Darcy's law. Darcy's law allows us to define a flow velocity. So this is a velocity which is equal to permeability, viscosity of the fluid, the pressure drop with radius. Um, and so if we write it in this particular form for flow towards a well, we can merely note that if we want to get the volumetric flow rate, we can get that as a function of the per unit area flow rate, perhaps in other courses we've called this a velocity, multiplied by a cross-sectional area. So velocity times area gives you meters per second times meters squared, cubic meters per second. And so what we can do with Darcy's law is we can just uh, define uh, for flow into a well. So if you're sucking water out of this particular well, then the geometry of this, if you look down in plan view for a single well, the flow lines that would be coming into it look like this and like this and so if you wanted to you could take a two flow lines which define a flow path and you can define uh, a wedge of cake if you like which is exactly what this is and so this is saying that any flow that originates along this surface has to end up on this surface it happens to be converging because it's converging um, I suppose if you wanted to, you could look at the change in pressure along this radius. So if you drew um, a section along here and looked at the pressure difference, then it would look something like this. And it looks like this because this individual component here would be dp dr. And we know that from uh, this, if you looked at the velocity, certainly the velocity of the fluid coming across here, if the same volume has to come across here per unit time as goes across here, it has to be speeding up as you get to here. So if this is getting larger as you go closer to the well bore, then by definition this pressure gradient must be increasing as you go closer to the well bore. So this is a small gradient, this is a large gradient, uh, it's a positive gradient uh, in this direction, hence the negative sign here. And so if we do this, what we can do is we can merely uh, note that this is going to be constant, the product of these two. This we can get from Darcy's law, from this. This we can define merely as a function of this area shown on this figure here which is a function of 2 pi r, which is the circumference all the way around here, right? This would be the circumference, 2 pi r. And the length would be the, the height of this. So this area here can be multiplied by this. And if we do that, we get this expression just by combining these two equations. If we take this and just separate the terms off to the different sides, take the radius off to one side, which exists here, and here, take the pressure off to one side, which exists only on one side anyway, and separate the variables out. Then we can do this integration. 1 over r is a log between the limits of r2 and r1. Uh, this is a constant, so it's uh, merely a magnitude that gets substituted for the integral between these two limits. And just by rearranging it in terms of flow rate, we get the flow rate is given by this very simple relationship. Uh, the pressure between the inside and the outside, the radius difference between the external portion and the internal portion, the permeability, and the viscosity. And so if we know each of these parameters, we can make at least an estimate of what the mass flow rate, or the volumetric flow rate is. And if we multiply the volumetric flow rate by the density, we end up with the mass flow rate, which is what we want. Because we know that the power is equal to the mass flow rate times C times delta T. You've seen that expression many times, and I won't go back for it, I guess. And so reasonable numbers for those, I noticed I didn't do the calculation down here. 
Well, permeability, uh, Millie Darcy uh, is not an unreasonable uh, permeability for a viable geothermal reservoir. Uh, we talked about on the first time that the EGS projects typically have to get micro Darcy, 10 to the minus 18 meters squared permeabilities up to this magnitude to be viable. So this is an unusual magnitude. Typical values for the viscosity for water, certainly you know from 303 that at 20 degrees centigrade, the viscosity of water is 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds. Uh, it uh, drops by a fact, an order of magnitude as you go up to about 200 degrees centigrade. So it flows much more easily when it's hotter. This would be liquid water, not steam. The length typically uh, for the process zone in a well bore might be a kilometer deep. It uh, might be shorter or longer. Um, the pressure difference that is driving flow is the depression, if you like, of the fluid pressure that you have within your well bore. And so I suppose you might be thinking about when you have, um, if you look in plan view at a well that is a production well, so you're taking fluid out of here, maybe you're re-injecting fluid back into a well, and you can imagine that you'd have some kind of um, geometric pattern called a five spot, called a five spot because you're injecting from one well and you're re-injecting from the four around it. And of course, if you keep on with this, then it would be another um, producer in this particular location. So in other words, you have a repeating geometry. But if you take this geometry here, and you look at the boundary between these two individual wells, you might expect, uh, I guess I can draw this in, in plan view. So this would be uh, ground surface. This could be a cap rock, and this could be your geothermal reservoir. And so if you think about the wells that you might have that would be tapping this, then they might, might look something like this. And so the idea is that this is the, the reservoir here, and you want to be able to get fluids to go from the injection, the re-injection location here to the recovery location. And so if you think about what the pressure distributions might originally be, then you can imagine that uh, distance versus pressure might look like this. So imagine that the initial pressure in the system is just given by the fact that it's an un tapped reservoir and the pressure is just some uniform value across it. If you want to be able to suck fluid out of here, you've got the maximum reduction in pressure that you could have would be by taking this pressure down to this particular location here. And so if you do that, uh, you could also think about there's a certain maximum pressure that you could apply to re-inject it. Say they're symmetric. If that were the case, then you'd think that by drawing down the pressure here, the profile of the pressure would look something like this. And this uh, would be what we have called P1 minus P2. This term here, right? This is the pressure at this boundary here relative to the external pressure. And of course, the external pressure at this radius, this radius is defined as the halfway point between your well, your recovery well, and the injection well. So this would be uh, what we've called, uh, well, we didn't call it that. We called it uh, R2 minus R1. So, these are. so this R2 might be half the well spacing, which we've drawn here. And R1 is a relatively small number compared to that. Um, so, so just some ballpark numbers for this. This is this one kilometer within the zone. This is L. Delta P is going to be this pressure here. So this might be uh, 1,000 meters times the density unit weight of water, which would be whatever that is. I, I guess that's about 10 MPa of that order. So this could be about 10 MPa. 
Well spacing might be um, a kilometer between them or half a kilometer. So this is of the order of um, 500 meters to 250 meters, just in terms of ballpark numbers. And a four inch radius well, eight inch diameter, wouldn't be an unreasonable uh, size for a well. And so you could use these if you wanted to, to be able to come up with the volumetric flow rate. If you know the volumetric flow rate and the density of the fluid that you're pumping, you have a mass flow rate. And if you know the specific heat capacity, 4187, isn't it, kilojoules per kilogram? Uh, and you know the temperature change, which might be 200 degrees centigrade of that order, then you have some basis to at least be able to calculate what this might be. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's one, a first step. So that's getting wa water to the well in the first place. The second one, of course, is that wells don't come for free and that there's some uh, friction that's typical in those. And you know plenty about that from 303. It's no different from a, a pipe in a house, um, and it would be shown by this geometry here. So this is the pressure that the fluid comes in. I guess this, in the way that we're thinking about it, might be the, um, the part of the well that comes through the cap rock. So this might be the... Um, the perforated zone or the open zone that allows water to flow in from the reservoir and then transfers it up to the surface. And so you know exactly how to do this calculation. We know that volumetric flow rate is the product of average flow velocity times area. Uh, we know the length is given by the difference in the vertical elevations of the locations. And we can write Bernoulli in terms of this. Pressure head, elevation head, velocity head, the pump head that you have to apply to use it. So if it's overpressurized in the first place, then you can just let it release and the geopressure will push it up the, um, the well. If not, you have to provide a downhole pump to push it up. And so we know also from 303 that if you try sucking it up, you can only suck up roughly a 10 meter column of water because above 10 meters, if you're sucking it, it will cavitate. It will fail in tension. And it's 10 meters because 10 meters is the atmospheric pressure. That's the, the, the vapor pressure of water is essentially zero. And so we're ready to compressional pressure of one bar, 0.1 MPa, which represents um, 10 meters of water. And so you have to use a downhole pump to be able to pump it up. And so you can calculate what the pump head you'd have to apply um, to be able to balance this equation. Um, you know if it's a pipe that doesn't change in cross-sectional area, then the velocity at point 0.1 and at point 0.2 have to be the same. Uh, so that cancel out. Uh, pressure on the surface would be perhaps atmospheric pressure. This would be the pressure that you're recovering it to in your reservoir that we just talked about. I guess what we called P1 actually, wasn't it? Yeah, P1, at, so this is P1 at A1, R1. And the rest of the things that you can calculate. Um, flow rate that you want, um, density of water and gravity. And so this would define what the power is that you'd have to apply to be able to pump that amount of water. And you'd have to solve it iteratively by using the head loss equation given the velocity. This is also going to be volumetric flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area of flow, right? Because it's linked to this value here. And friction factor, which is a function of what regime you're in, the length of the well bore, the diameter of the well bore, and gravity. So double the length, you have twice the losses. Double the diameter, you half your losses. So larger diameter well bores are more uh, efficient. You have to use less power to pump stuff along it. So you'd want to use those but they cost more to drill. So it's a capital cost versus a, an operational cost that you'd worry about. And you definitely know how to use this to be able to solve the system. And so that's how you'd be able to, to do it. So you know what the pressure is that you can accommodate coming in and the rest of the calculations you want to be able to, to use to do this. You can make pretty good estimates of what these are. This would be atmospheric. So this would be 0 0.1 MPa typically, say. And these would be the elevations. And I guess you also need to remember that we, when we define this, 
we define this as z positive upwards. So if you if you recall, just from our our sign convention. So so that's it. So getting fluid to the top is is no. That's why you do fluid mechanics. It's not, not a random torture that you have to go through. It's there's actually some reason for doing that. So I guess that's the first two of our components that we talked about in the subsurface. In being able to talk about how you get fluid to the well, how you get it along the well to the surface. And so now it comes to what do you do with it uh, once you get it to the surface and it's hot fluid at some particular pressure. And so we um, rely on the fact that we have some kind of conversion. Typically we'd be interested in using this to generate electricity. And so we have to look at the efficiencies of the conversions of each of the steps. And so I'm not sure that this is true. I think this might be closer to 0 0.98. So if you convert kinetic energy, which is spinning the, the blades, to generating electricity on the turbines, it's quite high efficiency. So this is probably close to 1. And the effectiveness of the turbine in turning the steam into kinetic energy is controlled by um, some efficiency of the turbine and some factor that relates to the amount of steam content which is in the system. And so if we want to work out this, which we'd like to know, we have to know not only the amount of fluid that we're getting out in terms of its thermal content, and of course P thermal is going to be equal to the mass flow rate, specific heat, and temperature change, kind of, or it's equal to the enthalpy times the mass flow rate. Uh, could do, use either ways. And so this is what we have from this previous step, and these are the, the calculations that we're going to want to do. And so let's look at each of the conversion systems as we have them. Yeah, we talked about this uh, before. I don't need to talk about that. So to do that, we need to look at the, uh, this conversion efficiency within the turbine. And we've made the case that it's a function of some constant, which is the mechanical effectiveness or efficiency of the turbine, plus the steam content that's present within the system. So we've defined before um, the steam content. So 100% steam would be excess equals 1. And so if this is equal to 1, then if it's 100% steam, this would be 1 plus 1 over 2, which would be the efficiency, or the steam fraction term is equal to 1. If it's all water and it's 0% steam, then by definition, uh, water would be 0% steam. 0% steam would be 1 over 2, and this efficiency would not be 0, it would be a half, right? So. And so the effectiveness of this depends on the amount of, of steam within our system. And so that's how we can look at this conversion efficiency, uh, which defines exactly um, how we get material out of here in terms of this as a function of steam content. But we also have to do something to be able to figure out exactly what it is that we get out of our well if it comes out. And we're not looking only at sensible heat, but we're looking at using the, um, the phase change behavior, which has the potential to be a much larger fraction of the heat than just the sensible heat that's in the system. And so to do that, we need to use uh, the idea of the, the Carnot cycle. And so uh, we've talked about this before when we talked about thermodynamics. We talk about a diagram which has temperatures on one axis and entropy on the bottom axis. We can talk about moving around this Carnot cycle uh, within this cap that defines uh, vapor here, uh, liquid here, and a mixture between vapor plus liquid in the, the place between here. We can traverse across this um, system from 100% liquid to 100% steam as we go across here without changing temperature. Uh, we're not changing temperature, but we're liberating energy from the system as we go from one to the other. Or you could look at it as putting energy, thermal energy, into the system to go from one to the other. We're not doing any work. Uh, and as we 
move down here, so we go adiabatically, no change in pressure and no change in temperature as we go against here, and we're relying on the phase change to be what uh, generates um, energy from the system. And as we go from here to here, and then ultimately back to here, then we're relying on an isentropic change, so no entropy change. So isentropic means that we're just going on a vertical path that is perpendicular to this portion here. And if we can do that, then we can identify a number of expressions that tell us what's going on in the system. One is we can define the thermodynamic efficiency of the system as the difference between the temperatures, in absolute temperatures, between the system in terms of the um, original system temperature T1 and the final system T2. So the highest, in absolute terms, the magnitudes of these uh, magnitudes are independent of their ratio uh, because if we start off with a much larger one in terms of absolute temperature and have a temperature change say of 200 degrees centigrade between them then the larger the magnitude of T1 that we start off then the thermodynamic efficiency of this will be ultimately closer to 1, closer to 100%. So we're advantaged by using hotter systems. So using a supercritical fluid system at 300 degrees centigrade is much more efficient even for the same temperature drop as a system at 120 degrees centigrade as you bring it out of the ground. So thermodynamic efficiency defines that. We can also use the second law to define the, the um, interrelationships between heat and work in terms of um, enthalpy, not entropy, but enthalpy. And on different portions of this exchange in the Carnot cycle, we can look at uh, heat, energy, and work within the system and define them as heat energy where there is no work taken out of the system is just the differences between the enthalpies at these starting and ending points. And where we do work is the difference between enthalpy at the beginning and ending points. But typically the ending points is not this because this would be a very small change in enthalpy. It says entropy, but it roughly scales with scales with it to some degree. But we're going to end up somewhere over here ultimately. So the change in enthalpy is the work that we do in going down from here and back to here. And so we can use those to define that behavior. And the other thing that we understood from before was that in this region that goes across here, if we are at 100% steam here and 0% steam here as our steam fractions, uh, I guess x, you could think of it as steam, then we can scale the magnitudes of entropy well, on this diagram since it's defined in terms of entropy as we go across here just in terms of kind of a linear gradation between these two according to the component steam content. But because the temperature or pressure versus um, enthalpy diagrams look very similar, we can also use it to scale uh, enthalpy changes. So we can scale entropy or we can scale enthalpy and it just goes with the proportion of the amount of steam that's present in the system, which really, this value of Xs just gives us a coordinate on this line, which is a certain magnitude. So this would be 100% Xs, this would be Xs equals 60%, say. 0%, right. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, through to 100. So we can use these three expressions. They're the only ones that we'll use today to be able to understand exactly how much work we can get out of our system by looking at the changes in enthalpy enthalpy as we go through it. So here's the, the idea. This is the example that's given in um, uh, Glassley's book. Uh, I think it's from his book, yeah, it's, it's quite high. So this is hot, this is almost supercritical water, I think, 352 degrees centigrade. 
at uh, 170 atmospheres, so I guess this would be 17 MPa, just in terms of the conversions. And it discharges at 30 degrees centigrade and at a particular uh, very low pressure as it moves between the two. And so what we can do is we can look at the behavior of this reservoir in terms of uh, steam tables. So this is a steam table for water. Uh, it defines the portion of the behavior which is liquid. This is the cap that defines the phase change as it goes from liquid to partial liquid and vapor as you go across here, and as you go from partial liquid and vapor to pure vapor as you go across this boundary here. And so the idea is that we can calculate exactly what all these parameters are in this particular system as we go from one uh, location to, uh, to another. And so in this particular case, um, we can look at the magnitudes of the beginning and the ending temperatures. So if this is the beginning temperature and this is the ending temperature. Then the thermodynamic efficiency by definition is the ending temperature converted for absolute and the beginning temperature converted for absolute. And so if you look at those magnitudes, the thermodynamic efficiency of this is something like half, 0.52. If you, instead of were working, if you jack these up by a certain amount, clearly the, the efficiency gets larger as you use a progressively larger and larger, larger temperature in this. So that's the, the first of our three expressions. The second of our expressions are that we'd like to be able to get the work in terms of a change in enthalpy uh, that is generated in the system. And so to be able to figure out exactly what this change in enthalpy is, we need to know exactly where we end up on the, uh, the steam table diagram if, for instance, we make some assumptions about what changes within our system. So this is kind of our Carnot cycle. This is going from the reservoir and flashing it within the reservoir at the same temp pressure and same temperature along an isobar to get to 100% steam. And then keeping it at the same entropy. So maintaining the entropy as you change it down to get to 30 degrees centigrade. What is the magnitude of the enthalpy that we'll have within the system if we do that? So we could go down at constant uh, enthalpy, but we haven't said that. We've said that we go within the system at constant uh, entropy. And so we need a figure that doesn't define behavior in terms of pressure and enthalpy, but in terms of pressure and entropy in our system. And so what we'll do is we'll realize, first of all, that if we look at the starting and ending points of these systems, if we start at 352 degrees centigrade and go to um, flash to steam, then the changes in um, enthalpy in the system will go from something like, well, 1690 here to something like 2550 here, which are these two numbers. So this is the change as you go across this top line here. And if you bring it down to the same magnitude as here and go across from 30 degrees centigrade from 30 to 30 here, you go across from something like 2556, which is this amount here, which represents this, to 126, which is this amount here, if you go down to this point here. So those are the changes in enthalpy that occur on each of these portions of the, the cycle. It's not clear that we get all the way across here because we don't know exactly what our steam content within our system is going to be. So if we assume that the path we're going to take is we're going to adiabatically, no change in pressure, no change in temperature, flash it from this point here to this point here, then we end up at this point here. And if we isentropically, we don't allow any change in entropy in the system as we drop the temperature, then this is the amount of work that we can recover as we go down through here. 
But as we drop down isentropically, so this is now pressure versus uh, entropy. So isentropically means that we follow the pathway down here vertically. No change in entropy from this point where it's flashed to steam. So we end up at this point here. And the entropy at this point is equal to 5 and change. Uh, I, I pull it off at 5.181. Don't know if it exactly is. Looks uh, close to it. There's five of these ticks between four and six, so I guess five would be at two and a half ticks, and so it's 5.2. So what we do know about it is that if we write entropy in terms of the proportion of water and the proportion of steam, and the entropies of both water and steam, where we define those from this particular cases, and so the magnitudes of, on this 30 degree centigrade line, the entropy of steam is 8 point something, 8 point, um, this would be 8.4-ish of that order, so 8.452, don't know if that, it is that or not. And the entropy here is, well this would be 1, this would be about 0.4, something like that, yeah, 0.4. So these two values here, for the liquid and the pure vapor, represent these points here at 100% steam and 0% steam. And so what we don't know in this expression is we know what the entropy is because we're saying it's isoentropic. And so this amount has to equal the sum of these two amounts where the only unknown value is this. And so this unknown value, of course, is equal to whatever the proportion is as you go across here. And if you solve this equation for x, it comes out to be something like 0.6. And so this means that if you divided this line up into 10 equal parts, then this would be um, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. This would be 0 0.59 here, or 0 0.6, 0 0.7. 0 0.8, 0 0.91. That's, that's all this, this expression is doing. We've done it, I guess, um, mathematically. You could also do it visually, as so long as you can divide this. But I guess it's not completely linear across the system. It doesn't look like it's completely linear. And so we have the magnitude of the amount of steam that's available. And so if we want to calculate the enthalpy at which we end up after we go through this iso isentropic conversion, is we can find out the portion on this graph, which is 59% steam. And so 60% you see, 59% would be exactly here. And so if we wanted to, this is the amount of enthalpy that we'd have within our system. And it's something like 1,500 kilojoules per kilogram. Something like this. You could also calculate it because we know these endpoints. We know this endpoint is equal to 126. And this endpoint here is equal to 225.56. So we could also substitute this in, that this is 126, and this is 25.56, these two values here. And if we substitute 0.6 in here, we end up with a value of 15.60. And so the relevance of that is that now we know that exactly at this point, which is where we'll end up. So we've flashed it at this particular condition. We've stayed with the same uh, entropy. And so with the same entropy, we've gone down to 30 degrees centigrade, and we've come across to this point, and we know now what the enthalpy change is. And so what we know now is that if we do it, I guess, um, visually, the change in enthalpy would be the distance between these two things here. So it's going to be 2556 minus whatever we calculated at 1560. Oh no, no, sorry, it's not that much. It's 2548. It's this amount here that we started off with, not this, right? 2548, which is this amount here. And this should be 2556. So this is the amount here, minus the ending amount that we have, 
which is something like a thousand kilojoules per kilogram. So quite a lot. So that allows us to be able to calculate the energy that's released. And so then all that remains is that to use our expression to be able to define this. We said this was roughly about 1. We said this was um, 0 0.85 plus this term here. So in our particular case, 0 0.85 times um, 0.59. So this is 1.6 over 2. So this is 0 0.8. Isn't it? Right? So 1.6 divided by 2 is, yeah, point, 0 0.8. 0 0.8 times 0.85 yeah, is about 0 0.7. And so this value here is 0 0.7. This, I think, we said before is about 98%, which is really essentially 100%. which is this here. And so if you wanted to, uh, since we know the power that we're getting out of the reservoir is something like a thousand kilojoules per kilogram, if we know how much fluid we're making, then we can calculate what that is. We said at some stage in the distant past that to have a viable well, you need something like a hundred kilograms per second of water at a couple of hundred, a hundred degrees centigrade temperature change to make five megawatts of electricity. This is much hotter than 100 uh, degrees centigrade change. This is something like 320, right? Which is delta T. So it's much larger than the 100 that we're talking about. And so the magnitude of this is going to be the ent enthalpy multiplied by an assumed desired 100 kilograms per second it's actually a big number. Uh, so instead of being 5 megawatts electrical, which is what we need to be viable, it's something like um, 20 times that. So this is something like 20 times that. And the reason it's large is because the magnitude of this temperature is very large. The, the water is essentially supercritical. And so that would be very rare for a geothermal reservoir, but it just happened to be and the example that was given here. So it's a very large output. To be able to get uh, 100 megawatts out of a well means that you could pay it off 20 times faster than if you're getting the, the break-even cost that you're getting otherwise. And so you can calculate that. So that's the first of these. Uh, so there are really only two that are of consequence. We talked about. Um, Multiple flash reservoirs. I'm going to go through this quickly. Single flash is what we've talked about. Flashing it and getting one uh, dose of energy out of it. Double flash means that you're doing it twice, but keeping some, doing it once, keeping some of the fluid, and then doing it a second time with that liquid and putting it through at a different pressure and through a different um, turbine that has different um, operating principles. And then binary production, which is where you're using the, the cold fluids in the system to, to do that. And so I won't talk much about uh, double flash. I think um, Greg Bignall does in his talk. So I'll leave that to him. I think it merely is actually doing what I just said. And that is that you allow it to flash once. And then you keep some of the liquid and you allow it to flash twice. And so you put it through different plants. I guess the one thing that you do have to figure out in this is that if the fluid that comes out of your system is coming out at a particular temperature and you need to cool it to be able to um, get it out of the system by condensing it, then you can calculate exactly how you can um, counter that amount with an amount of fluid that you apply to the system. So if the enthalpy out of your system um, it is given in terms of a, a total enthalpy, which is a mass flow rate multiplied by the change in enthalpy in the system as it goes from uh, reservoir conditions to coming out, then this is the total amount of enthalpy you have to apply to be able to cool that fluid down to a given temperature. And so the amount of cooling that you have to apply is going to be a mass rate of some fluid, water in this case, 
the specific heat capacity of water, which is 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin, and the temperature change that you want to put it through in getting it, in this case, from 50 degrees to 25 degrees centigrade. So this sensible heat change is just given by this, which is a uh, standard material property, a chosen temperature that you want to push it through, and the volume, the, the maximum amount of makeup water that you'd need at this given lower temperature to be able to cool it down from one temperature to another, to be able to recover uh, energy from it. And this becomes relevant because if you want to be able to scavenge heat from this, then in a binary plant, exactly what you do is you use that um, heat within the fluid which is now below boiling point to be able to warm it up to generate temperature in a second fluid and fluid heat exchanger. So now you have your water that's coming out of the ground. Maybe it's at 165 degrees, maybe it's at 100, maybe it's at 80. But if you have that fluid that you've already pushed through your uh, turbine and it's flashed to steam and it's been cooled because you've recovered work from it, then you can get extra use out of it by putting it through a coil as a heat exchanger to actually heat up fluid that is in a closed system. And this fluid might be something like isopropyl alcohol, which has a boiling point of something, uh, or, or isopentane, which has a boiling point of about 28 degrees centigrade, much lower than 100 degrees centigrade for water. And you use the non-contacting geothermal water, comes in at some temperature, goes out at a lower temperature because you've passed the thermal energy from one circuit into the other to heat this up. You flash it through a turbine, you have it exit the turbine, you condense it down to a, a liquid again, and then you pass it through the liquid to go back through the system. It comes in as a liquid, you heat it up with the geothermal fluids to a vapor, flash it as a vapor through the turbine, so it's under pressure here, uh, and hot, you flash it from a liquid to a vapor as you go across here, and you just run the cycle through this. And so a binary point plant exactly uses that. So it uses fluids that you've already got the lion's share of the work from as by pushing the liquid water through the turbine, flashing it to steam, recovering it, using that cooler water in the heat exchanger, and using it to generate an above boiling point uh, temperature within a, a, a binary fluid. And so we won't talk very much about this here, but if you know what the boiling point is, if you know what the specific heat capacity is of isopentane, if you know the heat of vaporization, the energy you get out of it by vaporizing it, uh, to condense it, then you can calculate that the enthalpy that you'll get from this as the product of the specific heat capacity of the isobentane, the mass flow rate, and the temperature change that it goes through in going from being liquid to condensing it, sorry, going liquid, flashing it to a vapor, and then recondensing it back to a liquid as you press around this circuit. And of course, you've got to apply some amount of power to be able to do that. And so this principle, which I don't think we'll spend much time doing today, I will finish now, uh, we'll talk about um, when we talk about geothermal heat pumps, because it's basically the mechanism by which a geothermal heat pump works. You bring in water from the outside. The water is at, say, 50 degrees centigrade, uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or 10 degrees centigrade. You use that water to heat up a refrigerant fluid within a circuit. You transfer the thermal energy from the closed circuit water that you're bringing back from your garden at 10 degrees centigrade, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, to be able to warm up the, um, the heat exchanger. You go through a vapor change of a refrigerant fluid. You use that not to generate uh, electricity, but you use that to be able to go to the phase change to be able to suck the heat out of the geothermal water to do that. And so you're using phase change to be able to more efficiently suck the thermal energy out of the system to store it as heat and then to boost it up to some amount of heat, which is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, to be able to heat your house up to some temperature. So it uses exactly the same principle 
as a binary plant in that you're using a heat fluid that uh, can convert between liquid and, and vapor at some characteristic temperature, just like a refrigerator or an air conditioner, to be able to get some thermodynamic advantage where you're providing a bit of energy in way of compression. You're compressing it from a vapor to a liquid by providing energy through electrical energy and compressing it, and then, then harnessing the energy from the subsurface by pulling that heat out of the ground through a coil and then uh, dumping that heat as reject energy, uh, as heat into your house in the wintertime or as cool into your house in the summertime when you just change with the circuits. And that's, that's essentially it.